Okay. <clears throat> so I'll just uh, give a very quick introduction in English. And if you guys don't understand what I'm saying, uh, or you'd like me to repeat it, please just let me know and, and I'll say it in Norwegian if anyone has a problem um, understanding what I'm saying. So my name is Paul. Uh, I do run a YouTube channel called Noshk Prepper. I've got a Facebook group, which is called Noshk Prepper as well. Um, and I'll provide you guys with all this contact information afterwards. And my goal, as I've mentioned to you guys, is really just that people are prepared and ready for what's coming. My family has been through this. Um, they've been through starvation, they've been through prison, uh, they've been through persecution. And so for me, it's really important that we are realistic about the times we're going into and we're realistic about what we're going to face. That said, uh, I hope we enjoy tonight. It's not to depress anyone. This is for us to be prepared and not scared. Uh, so it's very important for us to understand. So if you have any questions, this isn't a monologue. You can just lift your hand and you can just ask me immediately and then we'll um, and then I'll answer the questions. So really what I want to do tonight is I want to cover the questions about what should we be storing, how much should we store, how should we store it, and why we're storing it. So it's really just to have these very high level questions. So what should we be storing now? A lot of the different prepping channels that you'll watch, hey, a lot of the different prepping channels that you'll watch and these, these experts that you'll see on YouTube and people giving recommendations, they'll all say, oh, store the things that you eat. That's the most important thing. And they, call, they say something, they say, you get food fatigue, you get sick of eating the same thing. My parents went through starvation. Let me tell you now that hunger is the best flavor enhancer. You don't need sauce if you're hungry. I'll tell you now. You start with the basics. Forget all the fancy things, just start with the basics. So what do I mean by the basics? I mean the things that store long-term. Rice, pasta, wheat, oats. So havra, these are the things that you store. Now, for your oils, your vegetable oils don't store very long before they go bad. What you want, instead of buying extra virgin olive oil, buy the processed olive oil because it will store longer. You can make your own ghee. So you can take the butter, you heat the butter up in a glass jar in the oven. Don't heat it over 100 degrees, otherwise the, when the water separates, it'll start to boil and it'll throw the butter out everywhere. It'll throw the fats out. But if you heat it up to about 70 to 80 degrees, all the milk solids will sink to the bottom, the oil will float on the top. Now, most people recommend that you buy unsalted, natural butter that hasn't got the vitamin D in it. I'm telling you now, it won't matter. It will not matter. If you can't afford the natural butter, just buy the butter that has the artificial vitamin D and the salt because the salt will not dissolve in the oil. It will sink into the milk solids and the water at the bottom. So if you just skim the oil off, you will still have the milk fat and it will store for a very long time. Okay, so don't worry too much about that. The butter will be one of the first things that will go. Because if they can't feed the cows, they're not going to be getting much milk. And the butter, the ghee will last you if you store it properly in a dark room that's cool. You may get anywhere between five to 15 years of storage life if you put it in the glass jar and the glass jar is heated up and, and very sterile and hot. My family used to do this with the butter they produced in both Russia and China and they could store it for at least 10 years. Okay, so this will store much longer than your vegetable oils. And it's important with the butter because you'll get your omega-3 fatty acids. You can use it for frying. If you've got wheat that is stored, okay, so if you've got uh, the veta, the grain, you can heat the butter up and you can throw the veta in there and it will pop like popcorn and you can use that to feed kids. So if you have fussy children, if you want a treat, then you can even do that kind of thing. But the ghee is extremely important because it will give you fats that you just will not get from other regular food. So these are the, they're the things that I recommend that you store. Start with the basics. Now, you have to understand that I'm, when I talk about the rice, the pasta, um, the oats, and, and these kind of very basic foods, the reason why I recommend them is that they have very, very high energy yield. They, they, they give you a lot of energy. What they don't give you is a lot of nutrition and a lot of fiber. 
but people usually starve to death because they run out of energy, not because they have low vitamin deficiencies. You get sick from, from a lack of vitamins and minerals, but you can always supplement your vitamins and your minerals by eating things that you find in nature. So for example, you can get things like stinging nettle, brennerschle, that is a superfood. That will give you probably 50% of what you need to get by. So you pick the brennerschle in the spring before it has the flowers, and that you can either dry it in the shade, in which case then you just add hot water and you can rehydrate it, or what you can do is that you can pick it fresh, and then you pour boiling water over it, and it will kill the, the stinging, like the, the um, I think it's like a, some type of acid, and then you can cut that up and you can use it like a spinach, you can use it in soup, you can put it in your scrambled eggs, you can eat it in salads even. So you've got your stinging nettle, then after that you can also eat your dandelions. So lervatum, extremely important, you'll get a huge number of your minerals and vitamins from lervatum and you can eat every part of dandelion, from the flowers all the way down to the roots. The roots, you can, if you pull it out, you can heat it up in hot water for about two minutes, take it out, and then you can peel the skin straight off it, and it, you can eat it like a carrot. You can fry it, you can boil it. There's a million different ways to cook lervatum, and it's a superfood. So there are lots of things that you'll find in nature that will provide you the vitamins and the minerals that you need. Vitamin C, you can take the pine, the pine needles, the tips in the spring, and you can make your tea from that, or you can just eat it directly, and you'll get your vitamin C from that. So these are things that you can do that will then add the vitamins and the minerals so that you can start to replace them in your body. But for storing your food long term, they're the simple items. Now, for those of you who haven't started storing your food yet, Kiwi sells five kilo bags of rice. I think they're still selling it for 49 krona or 59 krona for five kilograms. White rice is what you store. Do not store brown rice. It has too much oil in it, and the brown, the brown oil will go bad, and it will taste bad, and you can get botulinum and get very sick from it. So white rice that is treated, high in energy, stores pretty much forever. Okay, so you don't want to store brown rice. Your peas, your green and your yellow peas are fantastic. The longer they sit on the shelf, the harder they get, the less likely it is that they're going to get eaten up, and you can buy them for 10 krona for a 500 gram box, and you can mix them into anything. You rehydrate them in, in hot water and let, or let them sit overnight and you can cook them into all of your foods. So these things here are very, very important. Now, I still have a discount code for Urkulam. It's 20% discount. At the end of this, I'll write it up on the board. If you have not ordered wheat and your other things in bulk, please do so. I don't know how long this will be available for once people really start to panic with everything that's, that's starting to happen. So these are the things that I recommend. Start with the basics. Start with the basics. You can always add your soy sauces and your sweet chili sauce and, and all of that stuff. Now, what is one of the things that is the most important? And if you remember the story of Hans Nielsen Hoger, that they took him out of prison to, to manufacture. Does anyone remember? There was one specific thing that he manufactured here in Norway. Moonshine? <laughs> he did make moonshine. Oh. Salt. If you go to Federsherpa, you can buy 25 kilos of salt for about 170 krona. If you do not have a huge supply of salt, I recommend that you go out and you stock up on salt. It is extremely important because you can, if you buy meat cheap, you can get a barrel like this and you put salt on the bottom and then you put the meat on and then you salt it, put more meat on and then you seal it up and you put it somewhere dark and cool and that meat will be fine for, for one, two, three years. You can store meat long-term salted like that in a barrel. So I posted a video on, on our YouTube group about how to do that. And um, I'll probably post another one on the Bindish group so you guys can learn how to do it. Yep. Can you do that with uh, meat that has been frozen as well? Yes. You can do it with frozen meat. Now, I recommend doing it with pork because pork has a lot of fat. If you do it with beef and those lean meats, it will be chewy as hell. So I recommend doing it with the fattier meats. And pork is much cheaper. And so you could, you could fill a barrel like this, and if you buy nakka kutletted, they're about 80 krona for a kilogram, and you could fill, up, fill that up with nakka kutletted, and you know that you've got meat for quite a long while. This is how people survived in Norway. They used to dry it, they used to smoke it, they used to salt it. So go out and make sure that you have enough salt, because producing salt is a very energy intense process, and when the energy prices go up, the price of salt will go up. 
So make sure that you have sufficient salt. Right, so how much do you need? Now people throw all kinds of numbers around all the time, but I sat down and I worked out all the calculations based on age and gender and all of this kind of stuff and how much work that you do. And I'll give you a very rough guide. An adult working moderately hard, so doing heavy physical work, will eat about 25 kilograms of carbohydrates in a month. So that means if you buy 25 kilograms of wheat, you'll be sick of eating wheat, but you won't die in a month providing that you have the minerals and the vitamins you need as well. So this is very important. So if you imagine that a five kilogram bag of rice from Kiwi costs you, let's say 60 krona, times that by five for 300 krona, you have enough food for a month. There is no excuse for people to not have food for three to six months. All of us can afford to have at least three months worth of food. That is the rule. Now, if you've got children in the house, if you're a little older, if you're not doing as much hard work, uh, you will eat much less. But we're in a situation now where I don't think having extra food will be a problem. I think you can always sell or trade or there'll be people coming to your door who have extremely valuable skills and don't have food, which maybe you might want to pay them in food. So having extra food is always a very good thing to have. Now, I'm going to touch on that topic again about um, how much food, but from a different perspective. So if we imagine here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So let's say we have eleven people and this is a tight knit community. And all of a sudden, say there's a married, well, let's pretend that you two are a married couple and your house burns down and all your food is gone. But you guys are very, very important in the community because you guys know how to do farming and doing all of this kind of stuff. It would be stupid for everyone else to say, oh, you're on your own, you lost your food, good luck to you that happens that's a disaster because that's a bunch of skill that you guys bring to the table that has now disappeared so do not think for one second that your goal is to provide enough food just for yourself your goal is to provide enough food for you and also to have enough that if you guys pull your resources you can provide for two maybe three extra people if they lose what they have because when you start to depend on each other if one person can't feed themselves or they get sick or something happens to them, that puts a big hole in your group. And now all of a sudden, when you had a very strong group, you have a very weak group. Does that make sense? So if you have enough food for three months, I highly recommend that if you're planning on just having enough food for three months, store enough food for four months with the plan that you have enough to give to another person for one month to keep them alive, if it should get that bad. God willing, it's not. God willing, we're all just crazy and everything just ends up being fantastic and we've done this for nothing and we'll just eat our stores over the next few years and it all blows over. But if it gets as bad as, as what a lot of people are predicting, then we have to be thinking that way. So please make sure that you guys have enough for yourselves and then also enough to have to support others or say, I come along to the group and I haven't prepared anything and I say, well, look, I'm, I'm here. And you say, well, what kind of skills do you bring? And I'm like, well... Uh, I'm, I'm a doctor and I've got skills in natural medicine. Well, wow, what group wouldn't want to have a person that could actually treat illness and know how to... Then, then you have to sit down and go, okay, we've got this. What can we offer this guy so he comes and stays in our group and is invested in our group? Okay, well, then we can feed this person and bring their family on. Next year, they can do more farming and everything and produce for themselves. So what you want to do is you want to have enough to cover in case of emergency, in case another person comes to the group, and you need to have enough that when the next year comes, that you have enough to last you until you're able to produce enough food to replace what it is that you've eaten. So if I was to calculate it now, we're going into winter, you need to have enough food at least to do you until midsummer, maybe late summer, if you can do that. That's in my head the way that I calculate it. I want about 12 months worth of food. That's my goal, because then at least I have one season that I can grow enough food and I can put the potatoes in the ground and then I'm ready. And then if you think, okay, then we have to have a little bit extra to have some insurance, then you're starting to get really solid. You've got a really good plan. You've got enough resources to be really, really stable. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about insurance and stability. So that's about how much. So then the next question is, how do we actually store this food and why do we store it in the way that we store it? 
In the old days, they used to have the wheat silos and they'd put all the wheat in a silo. And of course, sometimes you'd get the, the mildew, the mug, and people would eat it and go crazy or they'd die and, and all kinds of problems and people would get sick. Our goal is to make sure that we can store the food long term and we don't get sick eating it and it can stay there and we know that it's well taken care of. We know that the insects aren't eating it, the mice aren't eating it and, and the mug isn't destroying it. So in order to protect the food and the investment that you have, there are a few things that you need to control. One is oxygen. If that food has oxygen in it or oxygen around it, then you can get insects and you can a lot of times get bacteria that will, will breed in there. If there's eggs, nearly all wheats, all different types of corns, all of that kind of thing, they're insects that have laid eggs. The reason you use oxygen absorbers is to remove the oxygen from that environment. Some of them will convert that to, to carbon dioxide and those eggs won't hatch and the insects will die. What you can do is you can cheat. You can take one of those mylar bags or you can take a heavy duty plastic bag that you can seal up and you can suck the oxygen out and then if it's the middle of winter, you can put it out in the negative temperatures, negative five, six, 10, 15 degrees and you can leave it there for two or three days and it will freeze the eggs and kill whatever's in it. But you take your chances that the bugs will not be able to get into the bag. The reason why I like mylar is that mylar is very thick, uh, it's food safe and mylar has aluminium around it, which stops air from passing through the polyester and, and basically getting back into the bag. So mylar is one of the only ways that I have found to keep the oxygen out. So I recommend to people, if you can get the oxygen absorbers, then seal it up in a mylar bag. It's the best way that I have found to actually know that it's going to be kept safe. If you haven't got the money for that, then of course you can use these barrels and buckets and things like that and you can put it in the cold for, for a few days and then you can store it. But mylar by far is, is the best and the cheapest way to do it that I've found. Mylar. So mylar is, is a, um, it's a laminate of polyester plastic and aluminium, very, very thin. And so it's a silver bag. I should have brought some, but uh, I, I was delivering mylar bags and oxygen absorbers to people all day today and I forgot to keep some for myself. Uh, and you can seal it very easily. So you can take a, a clothes iron and if you have a straight edge like this and you put the mylar bag across, you can just run the iron over and it will seal it tight. So it's very easy to use. It's very robust, very strong, and it lasts a very long time. And I learned this from the Latter-day Saints. There, there are women who are like Seventh-day Adventists in, in uh, the United States. And these ladies are just brilliant at food storage and canning and prepping. These women are amazing. So everything I know about that, I've learned from them. So if you're on Facebook, look up LDS, LDS, uh, and I think it's called LDS Food Canning or Canning, and you'll probably find that group. Otherwise, add me on Facebook, and you'll see the groups that I'm following, and just start following these women. They're absolutely brilliant. So we've covered the mylar. So one of the things that I also talk a lot about are the different types of barrels and buckets and containers that, that you can use for storing your mylar in. Now. We are all familiar with these kind of buckets. These buckets usually are made of polypropylene, which is a food safe plastic. The downside to these buckets, although they're very cheap, is that you have to keep them reasonably warm, otherwise they go brittle, and if you hit them, they break. So if I was to have this bucket in minus five degrees, and I hit it on the edge of this table, it would just crack. But while it's in my warm house, it's perfectly okay. Or if it's in my cellar, that is you know, a little bit warmer than zero degrees, it will be fine. But as soon as it gets into the negatives, this is not good anymore. So then that means that if you look at the bottom, it will have PP, polypropylene. That's not the plastic that you want if you want to be storing your food in the garage or if you expect to be storing this in negative temperatures. Why is this important? Because if you're not storing your food in a mylar bag with oxygen absorbers, then you're going to want to put it outside to, to kill all the bugs in your grain and if you hit this too hard or something happens, then it's gonna break and then all of your food spills out. So you have to be aware of the types of plastics to use. So this is polypropylene. So that means really your best option is your HDPE, so high density polyethylene, or LDP, 
PE. So I'll put these up on the board so that that way you guys have access to this. So you have HD PE and LD PE. High density and low density polyethylene, these are food safe plastics. And these tend to be much, much better in the cold climates. Now, of course, we're in Norway, so cold climate, we just have to expect that that's going to be the case. There are two main types of barrels that you're going to get. You're going to get the ones that have a rubber seal and the ones that don't. This one doesn't have a rubber seal. However, it seals very, very tight and it has this metal ring. So I can put the metal ring around it and it will, it will clamp this in. It's much, much heavier duty than the plastic bucket we looked at. And it's also high density polyethylene. So even if it's freezing temperatures, if I bash it against the table, it's not going to break. Now, a lot of people will go and buy the 60 litre barrels or the 80 litre barrels and try to store everything in there. I recommend against it and I'll tell you why. If anything should happen and you have to leave and you have to take your food with you, if you've got all of your food in an 80 litre barrel, that's an 80 kilogram, maybe 100 kilogram lump that you have to try get into your car or up into a trailer, you're going to struggle. I recommend 30 litres as a maximum. This is 30 litres. This will fit 25 kilograms of wheat. So that means this bucket here needs to be strong enough that you can pick up 25 kilograms in it and nearly all of us can do this. Some of us, it might be a bit hard, but all of us, if we have to, we can muscle 25 kilograms into the car. Your food may be the most precious resource that you have. You have to think about how to take it with you if the situation gets really bad. So this is why I recommend 30 kilograms as a maximum. Oh, sorry, 25 kilograms or a 30 liter container as a maximum. Now, these here, all the materials for these plastics are coming from China. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the news that we just heard about this um, Nord Stream 1 and 2 being blown up. This means that the manufacturing in Germany is likely going to stop. And I'll tell you why. So I'll spell out the sequence of events as I see it. Most of Europe had the opportunity to buy cheap gas from Russia. Because of sanctions, they, they played the game with Russia. Russia increased the prices because that was the one weapon that Russia had. Now, when Norway had the opportunity to set a ceiling price for how much they would sell their gas for, they refused to. Norway said, we're not putting an upper limit on our gas. We're, we're going to get as much as we can. We want the market rate. And then strangely enough, two weeks after Norway refused to set an upper limit, the pipeline gets bombed. So what do you think the Norwegian gas companies are going to do now that the rest of Europe has no choice but to buy gas from them so that they don't freeze to death in the winter? You think Norway is going to be kind and, and sell it to them cheap? Not on your life. Our politicians and the big businessmen are going to turn the price right up and they'll ban be bankrupting countries. What does that mean for us? That means the manufacturing of plastic goods like this and consumer goods in Europe will stop. Which means the only place we're going to be able to buy things like this will be China. Do you think China's going to be nice to us when they realize that that's the only option we have for buying anything? No, they're going to turn the price right up. So these goods here that we can buy right now that are cheap, buy them now while they're cheap because you will not be able to buy them from Europe and China will take every opportunity to turn the price up and gouge us on that, I can guarantee you. I can guarantee you. Even if Germany and France and those other places can produce these plastic products, they have to buy the raw materials from China. But if the electricity prices get turned up so much, you, if you have a look at a, an extruded plastic item like this barrel, they have to heat the plastic until it's liquid. They have to use big industrial motors and screws to squeeze that plastic into a form. And they have big machines to then pop this out. That is very, very energy intensive process. If the electricity prices jump up as high as, as what we're expecting them to, all these kind of items, forget it. You will not be able to find them produced in Europe. And if you want to get them from China, the price will go through the roof. So it's a bit of bad news, but this is, this is look, maybe I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. But this is what I expect is going to happen because this is what I've seen every single time a country has a monopoly on something, they will always charge as much as they can for those items. 
This barrel here is a very, very good quality barrel because it also has a seal in the lid. And that seal in the lid will seal out the oxygen. These barrels, the downside of these ones, this one's high density polyethylene, so it's great in the cold weather. The downside of these is they don't stack into each other. So these barrels here, as you use them, if you're not filling them with something afterwards, you'll have a whole room full of empty barrels and really no way of storing them. These barrels here, at least when you take the lid off, you can store them into each other like a bucket and they take up much, much less room. For those people that are living in apartments, this is a very, very important consideration. You have to think about the space that you've got and you have to maximize how you're using your space. It's the same thing if you're storing water. So who here lives in an apartment? We've got one, two, three, okay, yeah? So we've got four, yes? So we've got four apartment dwellers. If we have uh, energy problems and electricity problems, then a lot of the other services that you would normally expect will stop. That means pumping stations for pump water, sewerage systems if they're using pumps to, to remove sewerage and things like that. All of these types of systems will stop. That means then that you will only have enough water to turn your tap on until the floors above you run out of water and it reaches your level and the people below you then will have some water and then people below them will have some water. So you need to make sure that you have sufficient way of storing enough water that if the worst comes to worse, you're not out there trying to find water while everyone's losing their minds and panicking. So that's a very, very important thing. So there, there, it's possible to get these water bags. Now these are water bags that I bring in. Um, as I mentioned to you guys before I started the video, it's getting very difficult for me to bring things in from China. It's extremely challenging. I will do it as long as I can, but it's becoming so challenging that it's, it's just becoming too much work. But uh, I, I do sell these bags. And this is a 400 litre bag. And it's got handles here as well. And you, of course you don't have to fill it to 400 litres. What's the benefit of having a water bag like this? Well, while it's empty, it takes up nearly no space. If you have a 400 litre container that's empty, it's sitting there taking up space in your room. So these water bags are great as well because if you hit it hard, you don't poke a hole in it. They conform to the shape. So if you put it under the bed, it'll take the shape of the bed. You don't have to fill it all the way to the top. These bags are great. Now, these are made of PVC. Do I recommend drinking from a PVC bottle for the rest of your life? Absolutely not, but it's better than not having any water. Now, anytime there's an emergency, I was a fireman for many years, so, or not many years, many years ago I was a fireman, and I went to emergencies, and a lot of the times when they had to transport water, they would do it in a big truck, and then you'd fill up PVC bags like this, and that's how you delivered water to people who needed it. It was good enough for people in emergencies, even though they say, oh, it's got lead and all this kind of, if it's good enough for people in emergencies, it's good enough for us if we need it. So we have a saying in English that beggars can't be choosers. When you're begging, you don't choose what you've got. So I recommend that if you haven't got a way of storing water long-term and you haven't got a system for doing it, look into getting something like a water bag or getting water, big water containers. You can get them from Beautytem as well. Uh, you can add a tiny bit of bleach, so a little bit of chlorine to the water, and it will stay there without get, growing mold in the water for a very long time if you put just a tiny bit of bleach in there. Of course, I, if you go to drink it, pour it into a jug, let it sit in a jug for an hour or two hours, and that chlorine, most of it will evaporate, and then it won't taste like chlorine. But you can find online how much of that chlorine to put in there. So anything like Clorox or anything like that, you can just add a little bit and that will make sure that that water will not go bad over time. The other thing too is that you have to think when the pumping stations, if you're getting brownouts and the power is cutting in and out all the time, what that often does is it shakes all the garbage that's growing in the pipes loose because the pump turns on and suddenly it turns off and then you get the water hammer through the pipes. So many times when that happens, you end up getting very bad quality water running through the pipes. So make sure that you have a bit of water on hand just in case that kind of stuff starts to happen. You also have to think about filtering. The pumping stations are pumping water through the filters. If you don't have a lot of electricity, then a lot of times the filter systems don't work properly either. So storing water is one thing. The other thing is that if you don't have access to clean water, then you have to think about dirty water storage for water you need to treat, and then clean water storage. 
and you don't want to confuse the two. If you're collecting water and it's dirty water and it has to be treated, you want to have its own separate container for that so that you know I take that out and I boil it or I take that out and I filter it, then it becomes clean, then I add it to my clean water. So you need to have a system with your water. Nothing will get you sicker faster than bad water. So it's really, really important. So then really what, what's left to discuss then is uh, how long should we wait until we run out and we get what we can get? My advice is I would not wait very long. With the oil and gas prices going the way that they are, with the energy shortages, making fertilizer is very, very energy intensive and it requires gas because they need to convert it to ammonia and then from the ammonia they create urea and all the fertilizers. So the shortages that we're having and the price increases mean that the artificial or the kunstierschel, as we say in Norwegian, will be very, very expensive and very hard to find. Russia is not going to come to Norwegian's aid with fertilizer and say, oh, you guys are starving here, here's fertilizer to help you out. Our politicians have made a bed that now we have to sleep in. They've made Russia, they've made us Russia's enemy, which is a very silly place for us to be because we're such a small country. So we need to be thinking about food storage and we need to be thinking about actually having what we need now. As soon as possible, you need to go out and you need to make sure that you store what you've got. Now, I have Mylar bags. Um, I have a, a shipment coming this week. And then, as I said, on the 20th, I have another shipment coming. After that, I just don't know if I, I'm going to do this because I'm prepared, my immediate friends are prepared, my extended friends are prepared, and it's so much work, and it's not my full-time job, and it's, it's exhausting. Um, so I don't know how much longer I can keep doing this and how much longer I can afford to do it, and people can afford to buy them because the prices are starting to increase. So if you're able to, to get set up, if you're able to get your plastic containers, you have to do it. Diesel. If you're driving a diesel car, you should be going out and buying Fargit diesel. So you should be going out and getting the, um, the, the agricultural diesel, and you should be storing that. You can go to Biltema, and you can buy a diesel stabilizer. Now the colored diesel is much higher grade diesel than regular diesel, because they don't use biodiesel in it. So you don't need to use the full amount of stabilizer, or at least I don't worry about using the full amount of stabilizer. I put 25 milliliters of diesel stabilizer in a 20 liter container of diesel, and that's sufficient, and then I just store that away. It's a cheap way of doing it, and then it's there for a rainy day if I need it. I store it in 20 liter containers because then you can just grab that container, stick it in your car, and you can go if there's an emergency. If you get diesel deed, uh, you know, you, you get some problem with the diesel, then it's isolated to just that container. But if you have that problem, you've got 700 litre tank, then you've got 700 litres that you have to try to filter. So I recommend buying it in smaller containers and having it stored away. So that's also my recommendation. Now, the one thing that we haven't spoken about here is we haven't spoken about food preparation. How are you going to cook this food? Some people have gas, other people might have like uh, alcohol stoves, but you have to think about how you can cook this inside your apartment or inside your house without drawing lots of attention to yourself. I recommend boiling. It's the most boring way of eating, but at least the smell doesn't go throughout the entire neighborhood. And that's one very safe way to do it. So boiling is one way, get your recipes ready now so that you know that you've got the ingredients to make some food and test it, start testing this out learn how to make this food using the cooking implements that you've got and the ingredients that you have. You will very quickly realize whether you need something or not and whether you've forgotten to actually add something to your stores. So you have to start cooking with that as soon as you can. The other thing too is the, the grinders. If you've, got a lot of grease, uh, if you've got a lot of grain and corns and things like that and you want to make your own flour, uh, you'll want a grinder. It's getting harder and harder for the manufacturers to find the individual components. My supplier in France said that he's having a really hard time finding stainless steel, inox. He said he cannot find it in Europe. He's having to order it from China and, and the wait now is over six months. That was, if I had said this to people two months ago, they'd think I was crazy. He can't get his hands on 
stainless steel in Europe. So this, we're going to see this happening more and more with things that, that we just never would have expected to have problems with. So if you've got a lot of grain and you don't have a way of processing it and turning it into flour and you'd like to make bread and those kind of things, you need to think seriously now about getting a grain grinder because it will be nearly impossible in a few months time. Um, the guy that I get my grain grinders from, he said that he's having a very hard time keeping up with the orders. He said that he's selling them faster than he's making them and he's selling them to United States, England and Australia and he's selling so much of it that he can't keep up. So I have to place my orders and I now have a two month lead time before they get delivered to me because it's taking him so much time to catch up on the orders. This is only going to get worse as more and more people wake up. As more people wake up, it will be much, much harder to get our hands on these types of things. So this is why I'm presenting to you guys tonight that uh, hopefully I'm giving you something else to think about and this will help you out. Now, there's one thing that I didn't talk about and that is the moisture absorbers the fucht putted. Uh, I a lot of the grain and rice and those kind of things that you buy, they already have quite low moisture content. So they are maybe 15% to 12% moisture, so 12% water. If you want to store things long term, there are a couple of important things. If you're using the silica bags, those little bags that when you buy a pair of shoes, there's a little bag and it's got the little balls in it. If you seal them up in those mylar bags, you cannot reheat those bags. So you have to store them somewhere cool because when that silica heats up, it will produce the water, it will release the water, and then that will go back into your food. So they're great at absorbing the moisture, but then you have to put them somewhere dark, out of the sun, and out of direct heat. I recommend using oxygen absorbers and moisture absorbers and then just putting it, putting it in a container like one of these where the mice and the rats can't chew through it and then you know that it's safe. Just think, this is a month worth of food. What would that be worth to a person when there's no food that you can buy? It will be priceless if that time comes. So, so that's really my advice with storing food. Now, one of the best things that about storing food is that if you store the right types of food, then next year you can plant it again, so potatoes. If you're storing potatoes, then next season you can, you can take the potatoes you haven't eaten, you can put them in the ground and you get more potatoes. If you don't have seeds staved and stored up and put in your freezer and, and hidden away so that you can grow your garden next year, you need to get your hands on the seeds. You need to get your hands on extra potatoes, so if there's no like planting potatoes next year, that you already have some stored that you can put them in the ground and you can plant them. We cannot think that we're just going to live off what we're saving here. We have to produce food and we have to produce more than we can eat. Otherwise, there's no way for communities to expand and grow. So it's very important for us to think long-term and think about sustaining this over time. And it doesn't have to be expensive. We're not talking about luxury. We're talking about just getting by. And this is how our grandparents did it. We're not talking about any crazy prepping or anything like that. We're just talking about making sure that if there's a hard winter, we survive. We're sitting here because our grandparents, our great grandparents and our ancestors did exactly what we're talking about right now. They did it in a little, maybe a different way, but they did this. We're just talking about getting back to our roots. And that brings me to another topic. And this is the topic I'll end on. Show me with your hands if a person has said to you over the last six months that you're negative when you're talking about these topics. Oh, you're so negative about what's going on in the world. Show me, who's, who's heard this? We've got one, two, three, four. Yeah, just about everyone. Yeah, just about everyone, yeah. Okay, guys, I want to encourage you. Find the things to enjoy right now. We have more than enough hard times that are on the horizon. Find things to enjoy. Go and visit each other sit down on a cup of coffee and with a quick lunch and enjoy the time that we have now and some of the plenty we have now. Enjoy it. These memories will keep us going when times get really, really tough. Okay, yes, the situation in the world is very negative right now. We know that, but we don't have to dwell on this. We're preparing now so that we don't have to be fearful of the future. So make sure that you guys are spending time and that you're decompressing. Turn off the social media. Turn off the news, 
disconnect from this for a while, you know what you have to do. You know how much food you need to store. We don't need the news to tell us that everything's going to hell in a handbasket. We know this. So spend that time decompressing. Do some things that go out in nature. Take the shoes and socks off your feet and go and walk around on your lawn. Go and smell some flowers. Take a cup of coffee with a friend. I don't know how much longer we're going to have the ability to travel and visit one another. So we need to actually find some joy in our lives now. There will be more than enough depressing things happening in the future. We need to actually enjoy ourselves a little bit as well. So I'm doing this, I'm, I'm preaching to you guys, but I'm, I have to follow my own advice because I'm doing this 24 hours a day. People are ringing me and having questions. I'm completely drowned in world events and, and what's happening in the financial world. Even I'm having to disconnect from this and just go and reset. And I recommend that you guys do the same thing. You'll, you'll be much better for it and you'll have more stamina over time. Everyone that I talk to is exhausted right now. Everyone I, I'm talking to is just tired and worn out and they're just under this state of just they're feeling pressure at the moment. Spend some time charging up your batteries. It's super, super important for your mental health because you're going to need as much stamina and endurance as you can have in the future. So anyway, guys, that's my presentation. Do you have any questions? Now, there was, a very, there was a question that was asked earlier about if you're storing food in mylar bags or you're storing it in those plastic containers, for example, from Yanya or Aeropris and those type of shops there. Those containers in the cold will go brittle and if you hit them, they will crack. That's why I don't recommend using them. The mylar bags are polyester, so even in cold climates, they'll still stay flexible. But the, the polyethylene plastic containers, the clear ones, they will crack. Um, so that's, that's my advice with that there. That's why I don't use, I, I use them if I'm, I'm buying something like um, soup packets and things like that, then I, cause, because that will just be in the house. It won't be in the garage where it's cold. So if you're going to keep those things in the house, these types of items, these are fine because they will never get that cold. But if you want something to last and you want it to be multi-purpose, then you want to get high density polyethylene. Now, one of the reasons why these kind of containers are fantastic is because if you get a bunch of sauerkraut, you can store it for a long time in this. If you have a bunch of cabbages from your garden, you can turn it to sauerkraut and you can store it in here. You put the lid on and it's good because it's food safe plastic and you can transport it and it's safe in transport as well. So these types of containers, because the plastic is much thicker and stronger, you'll get years of use out of this. Those plastic buckets, you'll get a year or two before it gets cracked or the handle breaks and it's not much good for anything. So think about th that kind of thing when you're spending the money. Those multi-use things that are going to last a long time, that's what I'm investing in because I don't know when I'll have the opportunity again to buy barrels and these kind of things if the prices go up. All right, well, that's it. That's all I had to present. I. Any questions, even if it's not food related, if it's just other prepping related questions, communication or anything like that, or, you know, I'm happy to answer in any questions you guys have got. Where's the best buy? Uh, that's, that's the challenge. I mean, we're selling these barrels with the Mylar bag and the oxygen absorber and the moisture absorbers for 444 krona for one barrel, the big Mylar bag that will fit 25 kilos of wheat and it has everything that you need and then you can just seal it with an iron. Otherwise, you can buy these barrels from Fellas Sherpa and I think that these are 499 krona a barrel. The reason they're expensive is because you cannot stack them inside each other so you can only fit a few on a pallet. Yeah, but you can stack them on top of each other. You can stack them on top of each other but not inside each other. Yeah, and they're, they're also virtually indestructible. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty tough. The handles don't last super long on these because as you bend them the, pl the plastic fatigues but i mean they're, they're pretty tough containers but i recommend just getting the 30 liter size if you need to if you if you need these type of barrels you can then contact me and i'll, I'll sort them out um, but as i said I, I'm, I'm getting a shipment of 200 barrels about 100 of them are already sold and then i don't know when i'll get the next ones because it's such a headache trying to get anything from china right now i just don't even want to deal with it um, so Fellas Sherpa, and even then I don't know how long Fellas Sherpa will have these available for. So, yeah. Any other questions? Well, just think of 
were common and not freezing to death? Yeah, so how do we not freeze to death? Okay, there, there are a couple ways to not freeze to death. The first one is to keep warm. <laughs> and you can keep warm in, in a, a number of different ways. One is you restrict the amount of heat that you're losing from your house. So focus on keeping one of your rooms warm instead of all of your rooms warm. Shut doors, put towels under the door so the heat doesn't escape and the cold doesn't come in. And the other thing is dress warm, wear your jackets inside, make sure that you're eating fatty food because the inside temperature will probably be cooler than what you're used to. So you need to eat more fat so that your body will burn that fat and you'll stay warm. And then the other thing to do if you have your fireplace and you heat your house in the morning at the fireplace, make sure that you take a kettle or a pot of water, put it on the fireplace and bring it to a boil. Buy cheap thermoses off Finn and fill them all up with that hot water. So that when you go to bed at night time and your bedroom is cold, you can take that thermos with hot water and you can fill one of those water bags, those rubber bags, and you throw it in your bed and you've got a warm bed to sleep in so you don't have to heat the rest of your house. And it's a cheap way to keep warm and I do it myself. I know it works. Anyone that's ever had kidney stones and has had to sleep with one of those things in their back, you'll appreciate the warmth that you get from one of those rubber bags and they cost nothing. They're like 30 kroner, 40 kroner from, oh, there's a million shops that you can buy them from. And the thermoses you can buy anywhere from 10 kroner to, to 50 or 100 kroner on Finn and just buy lots of them. Now, as far as thermoses go, Stainless steel thermoses, they lose the heat much faster than the glass thermoses. So if you look inside, if it's got the glass and it's got the shiny finish on the glass, then the glass ones stay hotter longer. So that's my recommendation. And you fill those thermoses up in the morning and then you've got hot water later in the day. That's the cheap way of staying warm. Any other questions? Was that a useful tip? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there are a bunch of ways that you can cook without electricity. Um, so you can have a gas oven, you can cook on your fireplace, um, you can take your thermos when you've got the hot water in it, and you can throw your noodles and your pasta and everything in it and just put the lid on the thermos and let it sit there for 15, 20 minutes and it will cook in your thermos. And you will not actually have to cook. So I used to do cooking like that when I was a cheap university student, I had a big food thermos. I'd boil the water, put it in there, I'd throw all my vegetables and then my, my pasta and everything in it and I'd put the lid on and I'd leave it there for an hour and a half and then I'd open it up and it'd be cooked. So that's also a way to do it and it's a very cheap way of doing it. A recommendation because we're in Norway and a lot of people have boats, there is a brand, uh, a Swedish brand of alcohol stove called Urigo. So it's spelt like this. And they make alcohol stoves very robust from stainless steel, nothing to go wrong with it. If you buy an Urigo stove, you don't have the risk of explosion from a gas leakage or anything like that. You can buy the fireplace alcohol, Pacebrenschel, from Bieltema for 39 kroner for a litre. Now, one litre in an Urigo will last you for probably a, half a week of preparing meals for 39 kroner. Now I have a heater called, um, I, I believe it's an Urigo, they call it a, a heat, heat pal. And one liter will produce 1,500 watts of heat for five hours. So if it gets absolutely freezing cold in my house and I have no option, then I can fill that up with alcohol and I can pretty much heat all of my downstairs with 1,500 watts so that at least I'm not freezing to death. And that works quite well. The other thing that you can do if you want to heat things cheap, go to Plantagen, go to any of those shops there and buy a terracotta pot. And with the terracotta pot, what you can do is you can put several pot, you can put smaller pots, put a can couple candles in the middle, light them up and then put the big terracotta pot over the top so that the heat goes up through the terracotta pot and it heats it. It's ceramic, when that heats up, that'll radiate heat and it takes very few candles to heat quite a significant space in your house. My wife has been burning like five or six candles in our living room and that's been enough to keep the, the temperature quite comfortable in our living room and dining area. And that works quite well and it's quite a cheap way of doing it. So that's also a very efficient way to actually heat a space if you have to. 
If you've got children, of course, you need to be careful with an open flame, but that's actually quite a practical way to do it. Cheapest place to buy candles is IKEA. So buy as many candles as you think you're going to need and store them away, they'll always be useful. Yep. Any other tips and tricks? Any other questions? Do you fill the cans uh, with water before or before? Should you change? I, I filled some cans with water, or my wife did actually, probably about, oh, I don't know, four or five months, I think, and we opened it up, and it still smelt like chlorine, and the water was still clean. You could probably leave it there for 12 months without having to change it. Okay. Yeah, providing it's in the dark. In, in the sunlight, then that's when algae will grow, but if you keep it in the basement, or under the bed or something like that, where the temperature isn't very warm, and you have a little bit of chlorine in the water, you, it'll be fine for months, if not a year or two. So, but just check on it. We should always be checking on our food. We should always be checking on our water and everything because that's our insurance. So just have a look every now and again and just make sure that it's doing okay. But you'll get at least six months out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there chlorine in the water? If you don't have chlorine, um, then I recommend that when you're storing the water, you have to make sure that the container is sterilized. So wash the container with like green grunsopa, some green soap or something like that and hot water, give it a really good wash and then fill it from the tap and you should still get it a few months. Our water in Norway is very clean, so it's still quite safe. Yep. Any other questions? I've covered everything. So one of the other superfoods that I recommend then, and I'll finish on this, We've talked about all of these types of dry foods that have very little fiber and very little um, nutritional value. They have high energy density, but very little nutritional value. One food that you have to learn to love is sauerkraut. So your pickled cat or your, your fermented cabbage is going to replace the gut flora that you're going to lose by eating these foods that have been stored for a long time. Learn how to make sauerkraut learn how to make it, this will provide you with a lot of nutrition, it will provide you with the bacteria you need in your stomach to be able to digest the foods that you're eating. If your gut flora suffers, you'll get diarrhea and then it won't matter what you eat, your body will not be able to metabolize that food and you'll end up starving anyway because your body cannot absorb it if you don't have the bacteria in your stomach. What we do when we eat we eat, basically we are a, a skin donut. So we're just a tube. We stick food in our mouth, it goes down our mouth here, we chew it up, it gets broken down by all the enzymes and the acids in our stomach and then it goes into our intestine. And in our intestine we have lots and lots of wrinkles where there's lots of bacteria living. The bacteria then eat what, what it is that we've put in our mouth and they poop out the stuff that we can actually absorb. So we don't actually absorb anything directly it's all the bacteria, it's all the little animals that are living in our stomach that eat that, digest it for us and poop it out that our body then actually absorbs and that's what goes into our, this is a very simplistic way but that's how it works. If you lose that flora in your stomach, this is why when you have antibiotics you get diarrhea because the antibiotics kill the flora in your stomach and then your body can't absorb any of that stuff and it just comes out as liquid. Learn to love sauerkraut, learn how to make it, it will keep you alive. Between stinging nettle, between um, lervatum or dandelions, sauerkraut, and the other magic ingredient is liver, levet. If you have access to those four things, you'll do quite okay for yourself. If you don't have liver, then you'll have to probably supplement that with um, fish when you can get it. Um, possibly ghee, butter, those kind of things like that because liver has a lot of things that are really nutritious and good for you. But the sauerkraut, I cannot state highly enough how important that's going to be uh, for your gut health when you're eating these types of foods constantly. That's it. Thank you guys very much. You're a fantastic audience. So I hope the people on YouTube and, and that in, enjoy this. I mean, this information is, because it, I, I try to boil it down, as I said, I'm, I'm being censored on many platforms and many channels just for providing this information. I have no idea what's so dangerous about this, but it's being deleted off and being hidden. And so if this is useful, if you know other people that can use it, I'll make it available to you guys, just share it. Um, 
I, I don't make any money off this. I'm not building a brand. I don't want to be famous. I don't care about this. I just want to see that people can get through whatever's ahead in one piece and we come out the other side healthy and maybe a little bit wiser. So, but uh, thank you guys anyway. I, it was a very good audience. Yannicka, thanks for organizing it. It was very much uh, appreciated. All right, I'll turn this off then. And then we can ask the real interesting questions. Mm -hmm.